Hello everyone and thank you so much for tuning in. My name is Dr. Sam Omar and today we're going to be speaking about digital oral design guidelines for foliage treatment planning. First of all, I'd like to thank you all for the invitation and uh, I'd like to welcome you to the monthly seminars that we have in Germany in uh, Frankfurt in Ray Europe headquarters. Uh, I usually lecture there with my mentor, Dr. JC Kim, where we share lots of knowledge about digital technology with our fellow uh, clinicians and also dental technicians. A few words for our sponsors. I would like to uh, thank uh, Megagen and I would like to uh, thank uh, uh, my team back in Korea, my R2Gate and R2 Digital Oral Design team. It gives me great pleasure to speak in the name of my team and uh, I think you know the whole team has done definitely a tremendous tremendous job. Uh, I also would like to thank Ray for helping us develop R2 digital oral design and also with helping us develop the R2 studio machine. Uh, a few words about myself my name is Dr. Sam Omar I'm from Egypt I'm a general dentist with a full-time private practice in Kari, Egypt exclusive to implantology and restorative dentistry. I'm also a resident at the prosthetics department in Cairo University. I'm a member of the R2Gate Center's development and education team, an R2Gate and R2 Digital Oral Design trainer, an international lecturer speaker on digital implantology, guided surgery and one day implants protocol. I'm also an active member of the Digital Dentistry Society DDS. So today we're going to be speaking about digital oral design, DOD guidelines for full arch treatment planning. Briefly to explain to you what digital oral design is, digital oral design is a concept that we've been working on ever since we started with R2Gate in 2012. Uh, since 2012, we had this vision for R2Gate is we didn't really want R2Gate to be only an implant planning software. We wanted R2Gate to be a full treatment planning software in terms of everything for you as a clinician, everything that you need to design and everything you need to plan for. We wanted R2Gate to be the platform that you could do this in. So digital oral design is this new software platform that combines all different aspects of treatment planning. So within the same software, you'll have a capability to do guided surgery, to do orthodontic cephalometric analysis, do smile design, digital face bow, occlusion design, all under the umbrella of one software, which is the R2Gate Digital Oral Design, or DOD. Our system mainly focuses on acquiring most of the necessary data for the patient through a single large FOVCBCT and a facial scan. And again, Today we're going to be talking about what we call the fully digital patient and how we can digitize our patients. In my presentation today, I'm going to be showing you one case. The reason why is because this case basically shows everything that we want to show you in terms of the digital oral design workflow. So we'll talk about the collection of the data, we'll talk about the prosthetic planning, we'll talk about the implant planning, and we'll talk about the surgical part of the procedure. So this is our patient Taha, and he is 55 years old. And uh, Mr. Taha came to us in the university, and what we, we wanted to do for him was we wanted to give him uh, full dentures. So what we started out with in this case is that we started out with data collection. So we always start out with a video just to show how the patient looks like. You know, obviously this patient had such a beautiful, beautiful smile, but was only missing the teeth. So we start out also with uh, digital photographs just so we could uh, keep the records of the patient and we could show that to the patient later on. So this is how we started with extra oral photography. We'll take one shot from the facial view and we take shots from uh, lateral view as well. This is how everything looks like intraorally. Again, this is a fully edentulous patient. The proposed treatment plan for this patient was to give them fixed hybrid dentures, which means that will start with giving the patient dentures first and then later on we're going to convert these dentures and we make them into uh, fixed dentures using dental implants. Since I'm a big advocate of uh, digital technology, what I wanted to do in this case is I wanted to give my patient a digital denture. 
the workflow for digital dentures goes as follows. So we always take the impressions at the beginning and most of the time, or we take the impressions analog. We do steps like the byte registration, which is also done analog. We establish a vertical dimension. We take centric relation records. We set an occlusal plane. We determine a facial midline. We do the tooth shape selection, and then we do the face well record. And if you notice, you'll notice that most of these steps are actually being done analog. And then the step that is actually being digital in the digital denture workflow is the tooth setup and the denture design. So the challenge that we had here was how can we convert most of these steps that we do up here, which was actually done analog, and how can we do most of these steps digital rather than analog, and if that was even a possibility. And this is what we're going to be discussing in detail today. We always start with collecting the data of the patient. So we go through a process, which is what we call the patient digitization process, and that always starts with a large FOV CVCT. In this case, we took a large 20 by 20 FOV. And we also started by collecting a facial scan. If you remember from the beginning of my presentation today, we talked about the essence of the digital oral design workflow is that we gather most of the patient information through a large FOV CVCT and a facial scan. In our R2Gate digital oral design software, what we do is we combine the data to get what we call the digitized patient. So the question would be, why should we use such a large FOV CBCT? What do we benefit by using such a large FOV CBCT? Let's talk about this in detail. So in essence, why do we use such large FOVs? Number one, this large FOV CBCT is the base of our treatment plan. And this is what we use to match the rest of the patient's data to, like models, photographs, and facial scans. It is also necessary for mid-facial plane determination, Frankfurt horizontal plane and head reorientation. It is necessary to have a large FOV CBCT to show us all the anatomical structures that we need to do a cephalometric analysis. Number four, it is necessary to visualize the condyles for a digital face bone. Establishing a facial midline is one of the very important steps when we're trying to do a full mouth rehabilitation. So far, we have been using analog devices that help us to correlate the occlusal plane or the dentition of the patient to the facial midline. And these devices are devices that we call the dental facial analyzer. But as we know, these are steps that are being used analog. So through R2Gate, we have been trying to find a method that would help us establish a mid-facial plane, digital rather than analog. And for that, we came up with the CBCT reorientation step. In R2Gate, since we have a large FOV CBCT, as we can see in this case, we could use these reference lines to help us establish a facial midline. So since we do have a large FOV CBCT, through steps number three in the software, which is the CBCT reorientation, I could use the soft tissue information and the hard tissue information to let me know exactly where the facial midline of the patient is going to be. The hard tissue outlines or the hard tissue landmarks that we could use is the glabella, the mid-nasal suture, and the anterior nasal spine. These are all anatomical landmarks that we could use to establish the correct midline of the patient's face. Okay, so now we have established a facial midline for the patient, and this is the starting point of our treatment plan. What about the vertical dimension of the patient? We always set the vertical dimension in the patient's mouth, and this is a process that we all as clinicians are familiar with. So when and why do a cephalometric analysis? So we do our cephalometric analysis always at the beginning of each case. The reason why is to determine the skeletal relationship and to get references angles for vertical and occlusal plane. Right here is a picture of step number four, facial analyzer, which is a step that exists in the R2Gate digital oral design software. And through the step, we get very important information about what we call a y-axis angle. 
and also helps us to establish an occlusal plane angle, which is what we can see right here in front of us. We'll talk about these two angles in detail in just a few minutes. Now, how can we determine the skeletal relationship through a cephalometric analysis? This is one of the very important usages of the cephalometric analysis. In order for us to understand that, we have to understand the cephalometric analysis landmarks and readings. We'll start with endpoint, which is nasion. So nasion point is this point right here, and it's basically the suture that combines the frontal bone to the nasal bone. And this end point is a really important point. The reason why is because the line that we call the nasion perpendicular or that we also call McNamara line is basically a line that starts at this point, the nasion point, and then this point runs, and this line runs perpendicular to Frankfurt horizontal plane. This line right here, again, the name is nasion perpendicular line, or McNamara line helps us know the relationship or the skeletal relationship of our patients. So, we also need to know point A. Point A is the deepest point in the maxilla, which is this point right here. And if we measure the distance between point A and McNamara line, it really lets us know what the skeletal relationship or what the relationship of the maxilla to the cranial base. If the maxilla, the maxilla should be on or slightly ahead of the line. So if point A is ahead of the vertical line, which is nasal perpendicular line or McNamara line, the measurement will be positive. If point A is behind the vertical line, the measurement will be negative. So the normal for an adult is about one millimeter. So in this illustration on the left side, we have a reading of positive five between nasal perpendicular line or McNamara line and point A. That tells us that in this case, the maxilla of the patient is actually protruded by about four to five millimeters. On the other hand, on the illustration on the right side, we'll find that the distance between nasal perpendicular line or McNamara line and point A is about minus four millimeters. And that lets us know that in this case, the patient's maxilla is actually protruded. What about the relationship of the mandible to the cranial base? In this case, we have a point that we call Pogonian point, or some people call it Gonion point, and is referred to by the two letters P and G. So a PG point is the most anterior point in the mandible. And through McNamara line, basically the reading between and the distance between PG and McNamara line could be either positive or could be negative in case the point is behind nasal perpendicular line. A normal for an adult woman is minus four to zero, and a normal for an adult men is minus two to, to plus two. The reason being is that in women, the chins are a little bit less pronounced than in a man. So now to verify this, let's look at the illustration that we have on the right side. In the illustration that we have right here on the left side, we'll find that the distance between McNamara line and point A is zero, so that's a normal maxilla. The distance between PG point and McNamara line is zero. That means that this is a normal patient. On the other hand, on the right side, we'll find that the distance between McNamara line and A point is minus three millimeters, which means that in this case, the patient has a slightly retruded maxilla, and the distance between McNamara line and PG point is actually minus 31 millimeters, which means that in this case, the patient has a severely retruded mandible. So how does that really affect us when we're trying to make the selection of the type of prosthesis or the type of final prosthesis going to be used? Let's see. So if we look at the illustration that we have here in the middle of the screen, we'll find that this patient right here on the left side has a normal skeletal relationship. And on the right, 
patient side, the patient that we have right here, do you see where the bone is in the mandible? If we try to correct the occlusion of this patient, we'll set the teeth to be in this position right here, which means that we'll go ahead and push the teeth to be a little bit more forward. But the challenge that we will face is that the bone location is actually very far back. So in this case, would you choose a normal crown and bridge type of prosthesis? Or would you choose a hybrid type of prosthesis? Well, definitely in such cases where we have a retruded mandible, we will definitely have to go for a type hybrid type of prosthesis rather than a crown and bridge type of prosthesis. A crown and bridge type of prosthesis will be mainly used for normal patients that don't have a retruded or protruded maxilla or mandible. A hybrid type of prosthesis will be used for patients that have a deficiency whether in the maxilla or in the mandible. So you can now see how it's very important for us to do a cephalometric analysis at the beginning of the case and how that would help us choose the type of prosthesis going to be used for this patient. In our to gate digital oral design, you'll get an automatic reading of the distance between McNamara line and point A, as we can see here on the left side. And you'll get an automatic reading of the distance between McNamara line and point PG. So we can see that in this illustration on the left side, there is a 5.0 millimeter distance between point A and the maxima of the, and the McNamara line which means that this patient has a protruded maxilla. And we'll find that there is a four millimeter distance between point PG and the line, which means that in this particular case, we have a protruded maxilla and a protruded mandible. So if we look at this patient side view that we have right here, this is a female patient, you'll find that we have both protrusion in the maxilla and the mandible. So now, again, you can appreciate the importance of doing a cephalometric analysis and how that really, really helps us determine the skeletal relationship of the patient and how we will start our treatment plan. But is there any way I can verify how correct is that vertical dimension that I have set in the patient's mouth through that cephalometric analysis? And the answer is yes. In the cephalometric analysis, there's an angle that we call the y-axis angle, which is this angle right here. And in Down's analysis, we could see that this angle should be usually about 59 degrees. So after you establish the vertical dimension, you could always verify how accurate your vertical dimension is through that cephalometric analysis. Right now, the next step will be to establish an occlusal plane. We also do that using a Fox plane. This is the analog method to set an occlusal plane. So we use references. These references are the interpapillary line from the facial view. So we make sure that the occlusal plane is parallel to the interpapillary line. And we also make sure that the occlusal plane is parallel to the aletragus line from a side view. And again, this is an analog method of doing. But are there any challenges that we face when we're using a fox plane? Actually, yes. The challenges faced while setting an occlusal plane with a fox plane method are, number one, the flatness of the occlusal plane set by the fox plane. As we know that the fox plane gives us a flat occlusal plane, but the occlusal plane is actually not flat because we have the curve of Spee and the curve of Wilson. So we compensate for this by setting the teeth in a way that is not flat. The second challenge is that the Fox plane method is subjected to operator error, and that might lead to canting of the occlusal plane. So to fix that problem, we have proposed a solution. So the occlusal plane, an ideal occlusal plane, should represent a curve of Spee, a curve of Wilson, and a midline for reference. So if you imagine an ideal occlusal plane, it would probably look something like this. This is the digital occlusal plane that we have been introducing in R2Gate Digital Oral Design. And as you can see from this digital occlusal plane, we have a built-in curve of speed and a built-in curve of Wilson and a midline for reference. And now inside R2Gate, software you could introduce and you could put that occlusal plane in the patient's mouth 
and in that CBCT, and you could adjust the angle of the occlusal plane, you could adjust the height of the occlusal plane as well, and you could adjust the canting of that occlusal plane as well. But now, if we look at that occlusal plane from a side view, what would be the ideal angle of the occlusal plane? And do we have any reference for that occlusal plane? And again, the answer is yes. So how do we verify the occlusal plane angle through our cephalometric analysis? For that, we use an angle called the occlusal plane angle, and it's this angle in front of us right here. And in Down's analysis for Caucasian patients, it shows us that the occlusal plane angle should be set to 9.3 degrees. So this is how we verify the correctness or the accuracy of your occlusal plane angle. And here it is. This is how the occlusal plane looks like inside of R2Gate Digital Oral Design software. One more thing that we do analog is using a facebow record. Well, as we all know, the idea behind using a face bow is that what we're trying to do is we're trying to match the axis of rotation of the patient condyle with the axis rotation of the face bow. So in essence, what we're trying to do is we're trying to put the patient in the articulator. But what we want to do is we want to put the articulator in the patient rather than putting the patient in the articulator. And for that, we have came up with a digital Facebook record. To start a digital Facebook record, what we have done was, we have gotten this part of the articulator, which is the hinge axis of the articulator. And what we have done is that we have digitized it to be an STL file. And now, inside R2Gate Digital Oral Design software, since we have a large FOV CBCT, and since in my CBCT, I can see where the condyler position is, as you can see right here, all I do is I just move that hinge axis part of the articulator and I match it to the condyler position of the patient. And this is basically how we do the digital Facebook record, digital rather than analog, with a lot more accuracy. Now, the beauty of the R2Gate software is that it allows us to do everything under the same umbrella and under the same software. That also includes smile design. So in R2Gate software, we have a module in step number five, which is the digital oral design step, where we could do a smile design, the three-dimensional smile design, based on the facial scan information. So right here, this is step number five in the software, which is step that is called digital oral design step. And here, based on the three-dimensional facial scan that we got from the patient, we're starting to set out the teeth and adjust the size and the shape of the teeth based on the facial information. The reason why we use a facial scan is through a facial scan, we could look at the smile design from a side view, from a facial view, and it gives us a more dynamic method to assess how good that three-dimensional smile design looks like in the patient. And since everything in R2Gate software is exportable, we can export that smile design and we can send it to our lab to make sure that they follow the same shape of the teeth that we want. Now, the very critical part of the digital oral design software and the reason why it was made is to give not only guidelines to the clinician, but also guidelines to the technician who's going to be doing the design of the prosthesis. In this case, we have collaborated with Avident, which is one of the biggest uh, digital denture companies in the world. And the challenge here was to send all the information digital. Well, Avident is placed in the Netherlands, is based on the Netherlands. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to send them all the data digital and no data will be sent physical. So here we sent the data for the uh, upper uh, impression and the lower impression. And right here also is the digital Facebook record as well. You see these lines that are sticking out. These are basically the reference lines for Frankfurt horizontal plane. This is the shape of the teeth we want them to follow. And this is the digital occlusal plane. And right now, for a dental technician, they do have all the information they need in order for them to go ahead and manufacture the prosthesis and to design a prosthesis based on these references. So we went ahead and sent that information to Avident. And the first thing that was done was digital mounting. 
So the digital mounting is basically the same procedure that we do of the mounting of models in the articulator. But here, because we wanted to do this workflow completely digital and without actually having to mount the models, what we did in this case is that in the Avident design software, the design or the uh, models of the patient, which is the upper model and the lower model, were digitally mounted to a digital articulator inside the Avident dental software. So that was the first step. And based on that, the design was done. After the design process was completed, what they have done is that they followed exactly the same information that we have sent them. So right here we can see the information of the upper model, and this is the lower model, and this is our smile design. What they did was they just filled in the distance in between the upper model and the lower model and the teeth. And they copied exactly the same shape of the teeth as we can see here. Same thing was done for the lower model. And the setup of the teeth or the design of the teeth was based on that digital occlusal plane that we sent that has all the built-in information of the patient and also they followed exactly the same midline that we asked for. So this is all the information that was sent based on this outline and based on the references that we sent to them. The design process was simplified and the feedback that I got from them or from our lab technicians is that they said this is one of the easiest cases that they've done because the reference information that was sent to them was very, very clear. And now when it comes to the design process, as you know, uh, uh, the, the Avident company, they have a patent of monolithic dentures. Monolithic dentures mean basically that there is no bonding procedure between the teeth and the base of the model. So right here, you'll find that actually the whole denture was milled out of one puck. And this puck includes the uh, teeth part, and it also includes the, uh, the uh, uh, denture base part, as you can see here. And it's all monolithic denture, which is definitely a lot uh, stronger than, uh, you know, the bonding procedure that is usually done for digital dentures. And this is how the final uh, product looked like. Uh, everything was sent to me in a box, and this is pretty much how the denture looks like in this case. I have received my denture in my upper and lower dentures. Uh, the part that was really impressive for me was the shape of the teeth and the, the color uh, and the degradation of the color in that incisal translucency uh, that I received in the denture. The next step was, and the, this is one of the challenges that we had, was we wanted to go straight to the lip. So now we're back at the university, we're trying to fit in the denture, and you can see that the fit and the retention of the denture and stability was actually uh, incredible. And I was very, very impressed by how uh, retentive the denture was and how stable the denture was. And now this will be our first step. So here, this is where we started out, and this is how we look like after the delivery of the denture. And now we can see that we have successfully restored the vertical dimension of the patient. Now, the next step will be to start the treatment plan, the implant position. If you remember, the main treatment plan that we have in this case was uh, fixed hybrid dentures. So in our 2 gate software, we have imported the rest of the information. Now that we have the CBCT information, we managed to place uh, and plan six implants in the upper. Most of the implants are actually tilted or angled, and we're planning to use angled multi-unit abutments and for the lower we decided to do an all on four all with straight multi-unit abutments so here this is our treatment plan that was done inside of the Artogate software on the upper we chose six multi-unit abutments with six implants and in the lower we have four uh, four different uh, implants all straight and all this information was exported and it was again sent back to the lab it was sent back to Avident for them to open holes in the denture where the prosthetic components are going to go out so we could do a, a pickup procedure in the mouth. So this right here is what was sent back to us from Avident. This is a prefabricated denture ready for a pickup and we could see the pickup holes right here. And also we could see these cutouts or these slots that facilitate the process of converting a denture and getting rid of the flanges of the denture as well. Now, 
one of the one of the very important things is that we noticed and the most accurate method to actually pick up the denture is to pick up the denture in centric relation that's the most accurate way and that's the way to actually uh, uh, avoid doing lots of uh, occlusal adjustments after we do pick up the denture but the the main challenge of getting the centric relation of the patient was is that after a long procedure like this where you place uh, six implants or, or uh, ten implants in the patient's mouth, you know, the patient usually is a little bit tired at the, at the end of the procedure and it's very tough to get the patient back in centric relation. So Avident have developed this uh, ramp right here, which is what we call the occlusal lock. This occlusal lock is basically just like a ramp and the idea behind it is that when every time the patient's bite uh, they get automatically to centric relation thanks to this uh, uh, occlusal lock, which was a very smart idea, and it really, really helps us pick up the denture with the same centric relation and, and basically very, very, very high accuracy as well. In, in order for us to select the cuff height of the multi-unit abutments, I was able to design uh, digital models. As you can see here, I placed the digital analogs inside and using the Megagen uh, multi-unit abutment try and set, I was able to select the proper cuff height of the abutments, and that really made my life easier. Not only that, but I was also able to pre-cut the titanium cylinders, as you can see here. I was able to pre-cut them based on uh, my digital model and based on the height of the uh, uh, denture that I have right here. So that also uh, really reduces the time of me doing my surgery and this is pretty much my setup right before the surgery and now I'm ready to go ahead and start to do my surgery and do to and to also do my immediate loading last step was to design the the uh, surgical guides that I'm going to be using at the time of the surgery and these are two R2 gate guides uh, printed uh, as you can see here and now we're ready to start with our procedure the first week we did the lower surgery, so we're able to uh, place four implants in the mandible. There's a procedure that I usually follow. If I need to harvest bone, we go with the 50-50 protocol, which means 50 Newton centimeter and 50 RPM. And this is a very nice way to collect bone from the osteotomy site. Implants were also placed fully guided, as you can see here. After we finished, we did a little bit of uh, uh, bone reduction in the anterior area just to make sure that we have a flat level of bone. As we know, in order for us to do immediate loading, we have to get uh, quite high numbers. So in terms of ISQ, which is implant stability quotient, uh, I need to get higher numbers than uh, 65 basically in order for us to be able to load the implants. So. Uh, in this case, we actually got uh, quite high ISQs, which meant that you know, we're definitely able to load the implants uh, immediately. This is all the cylinders placed in position on top of the multi-unit abutments, and the suturing was done right after we did that. And we went ahead and we picked up the lower denture, and this is how the lower denture looks like after completing the conversion process. As you can see here, there are no flanges right now, it's you know way easier for the patient to use this. It's very uh, I think it's very easy for the patient to uh, wear this and clean this as well. Uh, uh, you know after we do the conversion process. So this is how everything looks like immediately after the surgery. The next week we did the upper surgery. So this is how the upper denture, uh, the upper guide looks like in position. Again, everything was done guided, the drilling was done guided, the implant placement was done guided, and uh, thanks to you know fully guided surgical guides, we had uh, implants number 26 and number 16, as you can see here, were planned in the sinus, but uh, now we're actually able to do uh, guided sinus lifts uh, using the uh, oxydensification burrs, and we are in the process of developing carriers that could be used alongside these uh, uh, oxydensification bursts to do a guided sinus lift uh, procedure. So here we're doing the guided sinus lift procedure, and uh, you know basically we're able to uh, uh, do the sinus lift completely guided, 
and even the uh, placement of the bone particles were actually uh, delivered through the surgical guide and we also used in this case the internal sinus lift kit from Megagen or the plugger that is you know in this kit that is used to deliver the bone inside of the osteotomy. Implants were also placed guided in, fi in the final position and uh, we took a CBCT after the surgery just to confirm that we did uh, do a sinus lift uh, 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 successfully and indeed we actually were able to do that. So that shows how accurate the procedure of doing a guided sinus lift is. We also took uh, ISQ measurements of the upper uh, as well and most of the uh, ISQ readings actually allowed us to do immediate, immediate loading. This is the post-op CBCT scan. These are all the implants screenshots and we're able to place them in uh, good and decent positions. And this is how the, the uh, uh, multi-unit abutments and the temporary cylinders look like. If you look at them from an occlusal view, they look like they're uh, you know, perfectly parallel and that simplified the pickup process. We always use rubber dam and we place rubber dam right underneath the cylinders just to make sure that no resin seeps underneath the abutments. And this is how the denture looks like in position. Again, we only remove the palatal portion after we do the pickup process. And again, we do this, the pickup process in occlusion, as we said. So in order for us to be able to do that, we open very small, very, very small holes on the buckle side where the corresponding holes for the cylinders are going to be. These are only about a millimeter or a millimeter and a half diameter holes that would help us inject the uh, bisacryl material through the fitting surface uh, or through the buckle surface of the surgical guide. Uh, after we did that, you know, a few implants needed a little bit of uh, added bone, so we did add a little bit of bone uh, on the buckle side of the uh, some of the implants, and this is how we completed the uh, conversion process of the upper denture. Now you see that there are no flanges uh, whatsoever. And this is how the fitting surface of the upper denture looks like. Also, you can see that we have filled in these little uh, concavities in the denture just to make sure that no food uh, entrapment happens and there's no food that stays in between the fitting surface of the denture and the patient's mucosa. And this is immediately after doing uh, the, uh, the delivery uh, of the prosthesis. So this is how everything looks like. And as you can see here, the denture was picked up nicely in occlusion we and we ended up with very nice occlusion and again the upper and lower were done at one week apart this is a 10-day post-op and this is a, uh, a one month follow-up of the upper and lower uh, case together and this is what we're able to accomplish for our patient you know, obviously, he had a definitely had a beautiful smile to begin with. We just, uh, you know, added a small twist in there. So just to recap, basically, the idea and the concept of the digital oral design. You know, why do we use a large FOV CBCT? Because it's going to be the foundation of our treatment planning. The it's going to be used as a reorientation reference. We use it to get the condylar position, and we use it to do our cephalometric analysis. Uh, we used the three-dimensional facial scan rather than two-dimensional image to do a dynamic and a more accurate diagnosis tool uh, to do the smile design. CBCT reorientation and midline identification. Uh, establishing a correct midline is definitely the key point to get superior aesthetic results and essential for digital mounting. Digital facebook and digital mounting and virtual bite raising gives us unquestionable identification of the condyle. Since I can see the condyle in the CBCT, it gives us very accurate information about the condylar position. And this is only possible with a large FOV CBCT. Cephalometric analysis is used to verify the vertical dimension, to identify the skeletal relationship, and to get the occlusal plane angle for the tooth setup. Digital occlusal plane with built-in references will optimize the occlusion process and will simplify the design process. And now we've come to the end of our lecture. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in and listening to our lecture.
This is the uh, first lecture of a series of lectures we're going to be releasing uh, together with Megagen. Uh, again, thank you so much. I hope this was a helpful lecture. Uh, my name is Dr. Sam Omar. This is my email, dr.samomar at gmail.com. Uh, send me any questions you'd like to ask me. Please contact me by Facebook, uh, by any uh, uh, social media. I'll be definitely more than happy to answer uh, any of your questions. Uh, last but not least, I would definitely like to thank uh, my mentor, uh, Dr. J.C. Kim, the father of the art to gate and digital oral design. Dr. Kim has been, you know, uh, an incredible mentor to me. He, you know, he taught me everything I know about uh, digital oral design and art to gate, and uh, I definitely cannot thank him enough. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Kim. Thank you everybody for tuning in and listening to our lectures, and we'll see you very soon.